Question six reads as follows. It says to us, in the diagram, the graphs of f of x equals negative x squared plus x plus 2 and g of x equals to half x squared minus x are drawn below. f and g intersect at c and d. a is the y-intercept of f. p and q are any point on f and g respectively. pq is parallel to the y-axis. All right. Now, before we even go far, it is always important for you to analyze the love letter or the opening statement and see there's a whole lot of very exciting things you can take from what you see there. The questions that are going to follow, we might not know what they are at the present moment, but you should know, for example, if I look at this, when I'm looking at just that part, the equation of f of x, what can I do on this question by just looking at f of x equals x squared plus x plus 2. The questions are going to follow. They're going to ask us a couple of very exciting things. But by just looking at this, you need to know as a matriculant that there's a whole lot of things that you can find from this. You need to know how to find from the function of f of x, the y-intercept of the graph. You need to know how to find the x-intercept of the graph. And you also need to know how to find the coordinates of the turning point. You all know that for the y-intercept, x has to be 0. So already, I know that when x is 0, we'll be able to find the, the y coordinate of the graph of f. And then, of course, for the x-intercept, this is a quadratic. It will always have two x values where it's cutting the x-axis. So we know that at those points, the y values will always be 0. Very important for us to keep that. So it's not a complicated situation. And for the turning point, obviously, it has an x and a y coordinate. And if you want to figure out the x code to the turning point, you always use x equals negative b all over 2a. And then if you've got that x value, you can just simply substitute back to the equation of f of x, and that will assist you to figure out what the corresponding y value is going to be. So these are some of the important basics that you need to have in your mind when you're working with these questions. Because examiners need to test this. All they do is they think out of the box to try and figure out how can I phrase this in a smart way that the learner will not be able to pick up what I'm talking about. So if you are not aware, it will be easy for them to trick you. But if you just keep that in mind that it's going to be about x-intercept, y-intercept, and the turning point, maybe point of intersection somewhere, maybe the axis of symmetry. So those basics are the ones that you have to have in your mind in order to ace what is going on here. Very exciting stuff. Right. So let's jump into the first question that uh, we are asked in this particular case. 6.1 says we need to write down the coordinates of A. All right. Now, what exactly is A? We're trying to find the solutions now. We go back to the drawing. If you look at point A on the sketch, you will notice that A is the y-intercept of the graph of F. Now, already, we know that where the graph cuts the y-axis, x is definitely going to be 0. Now, we just need to find the corresponding y value. Now, if you know your story, you will know that if you go back to the equation of F of x, the constant, the last term there, which happens to be the constant, in this particular case, will always be the y-intercept. So the coordinate of A would just be 0 and 2. Very straightforward, no complications. Right, moving on to the second question. The second question says we need to calculate the coordinates of C and D. Now, what is going on at point C and point D? You'll see that at point C and point D, these graphs are equal to each other. Now, this idea of finding the point of intersections of graphs is not something new. We can ask it anywhere. All you need to know is at the point of contact, at the point of interception, your graphs are equal. So this is a smart way of asking you to solve for the two equations simultaneously. So I'm going to equate them and try to solve for x and see where this is going to lead me. Right. So how do you actually work on that? Well, you're going to fetch the equation of f and the equation of g, and then you're going to equate them and solve simultaneously. All right. So let's see how this is going to pan out. Let's create some space here. We'll try, first of all, putting the equation of f of x. Remember, at the point of contact, f of x will always be equal to g of x. The graphs are equal where graphs intersect each other. The equation of f of x is negative x squared plus x plus 2. This is equal to a half of x squared minus x. Now, what we need to do is just simply solve for x. Now, I'm one person who hates dealing with fractions. So the question that I always ask myself is, if there's a fraction in the question, how do you undo that? A fraction just means that dividing by something. Opposite of division is multiplication. 
So I'm going to double everything that I see here. Double all these things that you see here from the left until the right hand side. So if you double negative x squared, you get negative 2x squared. If you double x, you're going to get positive 2x. If you double 2, you end up with 4. If you double half, you get x squared. If you double 1, you'll get negative 2x. So what I simply did here is just double all these terms from left to right because I'm trying to get rid of that half that is there because it's not nice to work with fractions. It is easier if there are no fractions when you're dealing with this particular question. Awesome stuff, right. Now let's add the like terms. x squared is friends with negative 2. If you subtract on both sides x squared, those guys are going to combine. They'll give you negative 3x squared. And then if you add now on both sides, positive 2x will actually interact with that. They are like terms. It'll give you a positive 4x. You also have a 4 there, and this must be equated to 0. So then let's see. I don't like that minus. Let's divide all of them by a negative. We're getting 3x squared minus 4x minus 4 equal to 0, which we can then factorize. Let's just see. Remember, if you can't factorize, you can always use the quadratic formula. So we're going to have 3x times x. We need factors. I think if I put a 2 and a 2 here, we are definitely going to get a 2 from this, and we're going to get a 6 from that. We need a minus 4, so the bigger product needs to follow the sign of the middle term. So this 6 needs to be negative 6x. So that when you do negative 6, you're adding it with positive 2, you're going to get back your minus 4x, which is the middle term. That means the 2 has to be negative. The 2 in the second bracket has to be negative, and this one has to be positive. Why? Well, it's pretty simple. We need plus 2x and minus 6x in order to get back our middle term. So from here, you can clearly see that x is going to be negative 2 thirds, or x is just going to come out as positive 2. But then we are looking for coordinates, complete coordinates of the point of intersection. At the moment, what we are sitting with is there's a point C, right? And also there's a point D. Point C has got an x coordinate of negative 2 over 3, and point D has a coordinate x coordinate of 2. We're looking for the corresponding y coordinates. How do you find them? Just pick any of those two functions. You can either use f of x or use g of x, and you substitute in that equation to try and figure out what the corresponding y value is going to be. So what I'm simply going to do here, I'm just going to ask using the graph of f of x. Remember, f of x is just simply given to us by, um, it's exactly negative x squared plus x plus 2. So we're going to sub x values of C and the x value of D to find what the corresponding y value is going to be. So we are looking for f of negative 2 over 3. If you don't know how to work that out, just get your calculator and then you do the simple substitution there. I'm going to put here a negative outside. My x value is also negative 2 thirds. All right, and then this has to be closed bracket and then we're raising this to the power of 2. This must be added with negative 2 thirds again. All right, close bracket. Remember, that's a plus outside, but the x value has a negative x value. And then the 2 where the end is a plus 2. You work this out, it amounts to exactly 8 over 9. Okay, so that means the f of negative 2 over 3 gives us an answer of 8 over 9. Now, we're going to do the same thing, but this time we're going to do it for an x value of 2. So we want to find out now what is f of 2. Now, f of 2 will just be negative 2 squared plus 2 plus 2. That's 4 minus 4. It's easy to work this one out because it amounts to exactly 0. So we found the coordinates of point C and point D, the point of intersection between two graphs. This question is not necessarily about what we're currently looking at right now. Every time you're looking for the coordinates of the point of intersection of two graphs, it's always simultaneous. Equate them and solve them simultaneously. Very simple. All right. 6.3 now. What are they testing in 6.3? 6.3 say, determine the values of x for which f of x is less than g of x. So what is the meaning of what they're asking us here? They want where f of x is less or equal to g of x. In simple plain English, what it means is we want where the graph of f, which is the sad parabola. Let me just put it. I'm going to see the sad parabola. Okay is less than, which means below. In simple English, this means the said parabola, less or equals to means below or equal to, which one? The happy one, the happy parabola. Very important for us to keep these two things in mind. 
So we want to look, just look at your sketch, find all the x values where the set graph is below because they want where f is less than, okay? Where f is less than g. Now, we are in South Africa, so we do things from left to right. I think a lot of people, from wherever they might be, most of the time we do things from left to right. So I'm looking at them from the left to right to the right hand side. I'm trying to figure out at this x value here, right? Let me just use a different color. When I'm here at this x value here, you will see that the graph of f is below and the graph of g is above. So what I'm looking for is actually true from the left hand side. Remember, I want f to be below g. So it is true here. It is below, it is below, it is below, it is below until they meet. And remember, we said they meet when x is what? We said they meet when x is 2 over 3. They're also going to meet again when x is 2. So what I'm looking for is true before we get to 2 over 3. After 2 over 3, you'll notice that the graph of f goes above g. So it now becomes bigger than g. It becomes greater than g, which is not what we're looking for. So we are not looking for that part. This is not what we are looking for. We're not looking for these parts. These are the parts that we are not interested in. We want where the graph of f is below. And guess what? Again, it comes back. After 2, it is below again the graph of g. So what we're looking for is happening before 2 over 3, which happens to be negative 2 over 3, and it's also happening after 2. So how do you say that in mathematical terminology? So I'm going to say x less than negative 2 over 3 and x greater than 2. So what we are looking for is true from which values? From when x, this is actually 6.3, it's true for all x values that are smaller or equal to negative 2 over 3 or for all x values after or equal to 2, what we are looking for will actually be true. All right, let's go to 6.4 quickly. All right, 6.4 is asking us to calculate the maximum length of PQ where line PQ is between C and D. All right, so let's clear this and then talk about what we mean when we talk about these kinds of straight lines. So this is a straight line that happens to be parallel to the y-axis. The love letter did indicate that this line PQ is parallel to the y-axis. That means if you are looking for the length of PQ, all right, it is just going to be the y value at the graph of F minus the y value at the graph of G. Because basically, at P and Q, P is such that F is above the graph of G. So all the time when you have a situation like this, it is always the top graph minus the bottom graph. Keep that in mind. Very important. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do is just construct an algebraic equation here, which, which is going to be like this. PQ is top graph, all right? It doesn't matter which two graphs you're talking about, but it will always be the top graph minus the bottom graph, okay? Very, very important for us to keep this in mind. So the top graph at that point where these two graphs meet each other happens to be the graph of f. And the equation of f is negative x squared plus x plus 2 minus the bottom graph is half x squared minus x because that's where the graph of g is basically located. Then from here, we're just going to try and clean this and see what is going to happen. So if you subtract half from negative x squared, you're going to get negative 3 halves, 3 over 2 x squared. And then that's an x. If you do that, you're going to come out with a positive x, which is going to add with the other x. So you're now sitting with positive 2x. And then there's a plus 2. This is the expression for the length of PQ. Now, when it gets here, beautiful people, it can take three roots. Either they'll give you an x value asking for the length of PQ, or they'll give you the length of PQ asking for the value of x. So one of those things, two things might be given, and then we'll ask you to figure out the other one. But the most complicated question they can ask is maximum length of PQ, which is exactly what they're asking us to figure out right now. So remember from your knowledge of um, calculus, for maximum, a point, a graph, or any other thing is maximum, where its derivative is equal to zero. Graphically, if I'm looking at this, if you think about it, and I had to draw the graph of PQ, I was going to get from this, if you want, wanted me to draw this, I was going to get a set phase parabola, okay? And obviously, the highest value on it, 
will always be the turning point. So if you want to use the concepts of graphs to try and figure out what the maximum length of PQ would be, you'd obviously do x is negative b over 2a to get the x coordinate at the maximum point and then substitute back into the equation of PQ to find what the corresponding y value is going to be. That y value will be the length of the maximum value of PQ. Very important for you to keep that in mind. Now, in the context of what I'm looking at right now, I want to use the concept of calculus to try and maximize. Just to say to you, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're looking for the maximum, the derivative will always be equated to zero. So we need to find the derivative with respect to x of what? Of this length PQ. Now, if you derive negative 3 over 2x squared, you're going to get negative 3x, right? If you derive 2x, you're going to get 2. The derivative of 2 is 0. So now, after doing that, you end up with negative 3x plus 2 equal to 0, which gives you an x value of exactly negative over negative would be positive. So I'm ending up with an answer of positive 2 over 3. All right. Now that I've got this, I've got the x value there. It's positive 2 over 3. That is the x value at the point where um, this PQ happens to be a maximum. But we are looking for the length. So which means we're now going to go back and say, therefore, PQ is what you get when you substitute this 2 over 3 into the equation of your PQ. So that means we've got negative 3 halves into 2 thirds squared plus 2 into 2 thirds plus 2 at the end. Very important. Then if you simplify this, something awesome is going to happen. I don't know what the answer is going to be. That's where the calculator comes in. Remember, the calculator is an instrument. So you guys need to really use it. Negative... Um, 3 halves, so we've got 3 over 2 there, let me get my fractions nicely, so it's going to be negative 3 halves and then open bracket, what is your x value? It is simply 2 all over 3, okay, then you close your bracket, we, we need to have a square there, there's a square for us, make sure that you use the correct signs, you're not making mistakes and then don't rush yourself, plus 2 times, what are we looking at, 2 times the x value, our x value we said is simply 2 thirds, okay, and then you're going to close the bracket at the end. We have a plus 2 there, which I'm just going to simply put. And then our answer here comes out as something pretty awesome. 2 and 2 over 3, which can be expressed uh, as 2 and 2 over 3. Let's just keep it as 2 and 2 over 3, which is 6, 7, 8 over 3, if you want, if you like. You can put it as a mixed fraction, improper fraction, or round it off to two uh, decimal places. So that's the length of PQ that I'm simply ending up with. Very important for you to always know that if you need to find the length of this kind of a setup, you will need to find the derivative, equate the derivative to zero. Once you're done equating the derivative to zero, and then you can then be able to actually figure out what the solution is going to be if you substitute that x value you found back into the original equation. Very, very important. Okay, let's go to the last question of this beautiful question six. Um, it says to us here, calculate the value of x where the gradient of f is equal to 3. Our interest today is not really about answering the questions, but helping you to understand how do you analyze these questions. 6.5, the key word that stands out for me is the word gradients. Now, what do we know about gradients? Well, you people know that there are two types of gradients that you can talk about. There's average gradient and there's also gradient at a point, right? Now, in this case, they want you to work out an x value. That means there's only one x value the examiner is interested in. Now, if you're going to find gradient at one point, remember, if it's average, it's going to be change in y over change in x. But because it's not about average gradient, it's gradient at one point, not at two points, then you're going to use the derivative as your gradient. So that's the approach that we're going to use. So we're going to derive f and then equate that f to 3 because they're telling us that the gradient is equal to 3 at that point uh, we are interested in. We want the x value when the gradient is 3, okay? So let's just go and do exactly that. You just have to check the keywords. They will always guide you. They will tell you what you need to do. You just follow suit there. You will never, ever struggle in terms of trying to find what the solutions are going to be. So remember, the equation of f of x is equal to negative x squared plus x added with 2. Now, we want the gradient. What is the gradient? Well, the gradient is f prime of x, which is going to be negative 2x plus 1. The derivative of 2 is obviously going to be equal to, equal to 0. The examiner said they want x when the gradient is 3. 
So we're going to put 3 for the gradient and then we've got negative 2x plus 1 from here. It's just simply trying to find the value of x. You're going to end up with an x value of exactly negative 1. So the gradient is going to be 3 when x is equal to negative 1. Okay.